Okay. G'day. So, to start off, I thought you actually prepared some notes about how the human soul functions. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you had a discussion with Luli in the last session, which was great. And I had a look over that this morning. But I thought some of the notes that you've written here are really informative. And perhaps if we could even just go through those notes paragraph by paragraph and just discuss some of the points that perhaps weren't covered in that first session. Um, I would love to do that with sounds, you. Sounds good. So are you happy to start? Uh, sure. I'll yeah. read the first paragraph. Yep. God made a foolproof system with the soul. God did not design the same system for the mind. This is because the mind is a part of the physiological functions of the soul rather than being the soul itself. The mind is an attribute of the soul. The soul has many other attributes and characteristics, some of which are far more important to develop than the mind, and some of which are far more powerful in determining the divine truth than the mind has the capacity to absorb. The soul eventually contains the mind, but has many more attributes than just the mind. So to me, there's a lot in that paragraph, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but perhaps we could start with the very first sentence. I wanted to ask you, you said there, God made a foolproof system with the soul. Mm. What do you mean by that? Like, what are we, what are, what's it foolproof against? <laughs> <laughs> and it's almost uh, suggesting that anyone who has a soul is a bit of a fool, <laughs> <laughs> potentially a bit of a fool, but that's not the case. But yeah, the, the, when I say God made a foolproof system, it's really clever the way God designed the entire universe. The way God designed the universe was God first designed all of the laws that govern the universe. Okay. So before the universe actually came into being, into existence, the laws were already established. Now, the majority of these laws and the most powerful of these laws are governing the human soul. So that means that God, before God created the universe, knew that God was going to create the human soul. Mm. And in fact, the human soul has been, uh, the universe has been created for the human soul to exist. So it's like the human soul's playground. Uh -huh. All right. So, so we first need to understand that God made this big uh, set of laws that govern the potential existence of the human soul. Then God created the human soul. Uh -huh. And the, then God created the universe in which the human soul could, be, could use as a playground. Right. So what you're saying is God, really, God did all of this for the human soul. Correct. God created the framework or the laws that would govern the experience of the soul. Is that what you mean? And not only the experience of the soul, but govern the very operation of the universe in which the soul lived uh -huh. and the interaction between the universe and the soul itself. Yes. So, so God created a whole series of very complex laws in order to do that. Now, this means that God made a, the entire system foolproof. In other words, we can't make mistakes with the human soul. We can, uh, that, that are unable to be corrected, I mean. Uh -huh. We can make mistakes, certainly, yeah. that, that, that need correction, but we can't actually make mistakes where the human soul somehow destroys the universe. Right. And we can't make mistakes where the human soul is not governed by law still. So, in other words, the human soul is always governed by law, and we can't avoid that. We, mm -hmm. we can't get away from that. Mm -hmm. And the laws are all is previously established before the universe even came into existence. And what that means then is that the, that the soul itself is this integrated system that God created that interacts with the universe and particularly interacts with the laws of the universe because there are some parts of the universe that only get created when the soul interacts in the, within, within the law framework in a certain way. Yeah. That means then that it's impossible to break the human soul. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's impossible to, to cause so much damage to the human soul that it's irreparable. Mm -hmm. right? And in that regard, God made a foolproof system. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much we are fools yep. <laughs> <laughs> and how much we desire to break the laws and desire to get away from the framework. In the end, the human soul is an unbreakable piece of machinery that God has made that nothing can destroy. Nothing, as far as it's known, can destroy aside from God herself. Mm -hmm. Also, while the human body can be destroyed and go into different elements, and while the spirit body theoretically can do the same thing, 
it, it is highly unlikely that that can happen to the human soul. And when I say highly unlikely, we don't know because it's never happened. Mm -hmm. but, but at this stage, it's, there's no record of any single human soul ever being destroyed or being dis put back into the, its elemental parts. Yeah. Because of that, you could say that God created a foolproof human soul, uh -huh. a, a soul that is unable to be destroyed, a soul that no matter what mistakes we make, we're unable to fully decompose the soul itself. In other words, the soul will always retain its existence after its creation. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so you said a few things there yep. that I would like to ask more about. You said that um, basically the soul can't ever be destroyed. Even if we want to destroy it, yep. uh, we, it can't happen. Yep. But then you you described what sounded as far as it, we know. As far as we know, <laughs> yeah. yes, who, yes. Who knows that at some point in the future, God may have a process for human souls that haven't received divine love? I don't know. But at this point in time, there has been no single human soul that's ever been destroyed into its elemental parts. Mm -hmm. In other words, the human soul, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how self-destructive it becomes, and no matter how much of intention it has to act out of harmony with love, still can't get destroyed. So, so in that regard, it's foolproof. And in fact, it almost seems to be the other way around, doesn't it? No matter what we do, the universe and the laws that we interact with seem to push us towards growth, don't they? Well, they push us towards correction. Yeah. And so, so the reality is the way God just created this universe is that every framework, if you like, the universal framework, which are laws, which we mm -hmm. classify as laws, that govern the human soul and govern the universe itself and the interaction between the soul and the universe, which is a very important factor. These laws are unable to be broken and therefore they are always in operation and they impose themselves upon the human soul. So no matter how far the human soul gets out of harmony with those laws, the laws are attempting to correct the human soul back into harmony. Yeah. And this is the beautiful system that God made. It's, a, it's such a foolproof system. It doesn't matter how much we take the human soul out of harmony through the exercise of our will. The, the law framework that involve, that the, in which we live, the mm -hmm. of the universe in which we live, is pulling us or attempting to pull us back into harmony. Yeah. And so it's a self-correcting system. And eventually, given enough time, every single individual in the universe will be pulled back into harmony with the universal laws. Yeah. So, for, so from what you said earlier and what you said now, it sounds like the soul operates within a system, mm -hmm. which is the universe and the universal laws that well, God Well, the soul has. operates within the universal laws, yeah. and the universe and the soul are basically the subsequent result of those universal laws. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that and the soul is the most complicated of all of God's creations, the human soul is the most complicated. So it's far more complex than the human body. It's far more complex than the spirit body. It's far more complex than the universe itself, actually. Yeah, itself. so this is where I want to ask you, because in your introduction there, you said that you basically described to me, it sounded like two systems. One is the system of God's universe in operation, of which the soul is a part of. And then you described the soul as a system itself. Well, it's even more than that because, mm -hmm. because there are parts of the universe that are yet to be created that the soul has the potential to create through the governing systems of the laws. So really, the two systems are the laws that govern the interaction between the soul and the universe and then the, soul, the, the universe itself of which the soul is a part. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yes. But the soul has the ability to create new universes as it proceeds. Yes. So if we classify not only all of the universes that have been created at this point, but all of the universes that are potentially able to be created, mm -hmm. given the governing of the laws, then we're, we're saying that the soul is more complicated and complex than all of those things. Yes. Because it has the ability to actually seed or create those things. Uh-huh. So, but there are those two factors, the factor of the soul itself and the universe of that, that, that has been created in which the soul plays yep. are all governed by universal laws that God established prior to the creation of both the universe and the soul. Mm. Yeah. yeah, 
And so I suppose I was um, asking about, you, in your statement you said there's a foolproof system with the soul and what, from what you've just said, you, uh, it sounds like there's a foolproof system that universally. happens universally <laughs> Correct. that the soul operates in and impacts upon through the creation of new dimensions and things like that. Yes. And then today we're going to talk more about how the human soul functions and you could almost call that a system or a, it's a way in which the human soul operates. Yes. And is that, so this universal and thing that you just... there are all laws that determine its operation. These are all laws, that principles that determine the soul's operation. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So everything that God has designed has laws that govern its operation, yep. right the way through from the soul, the most complex creation of God, right the way through to the other lesser complex creations of God, right down to the individual elements. They are all, and even right down to individual subatomic particles, they all are created um, and, and governed by the laws that surround them. So, so none of them can operate outside of a law. Mm -hmm. Of, of, mm -hmm. so that none of them operate outside of the laws that God has established. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And mankind has yet to discover most of those laws. Mm. Like we think we've discovered most of them, but actually we've yet to discover a minute particle of those laws that fully govern the entire system of the soul and the universe in which it lives. Mm. Yeah. So the full free system is what? The, the universe in which it lives or the soul itself? Both. Yeah. Both are foolproof systems. Yeah. Everything God creates is a foolproof system. And we are arrogant when we say that God made a mistake because God does not make mistakes when it comes to any system that God creates. Yeah. And God created the soul and therefore God did not make a mistake with the soul. And, and any appearance of mistake is actually the exercise of our will in a direction that's out of harmony with the, the law. Yeah. And then, then these mistakes appear. Mm -hmm. and they, but they are of our own creation, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not the creation of God. But from your statement, it's foolproof, and you were saying that, yes. that it's foolproof in terms of destruction. You can't destroy the universe, you can't destroy the soul. It's as even far foolproof as it's with regard to when we create outside or attempt to create outside of the law. The law is still imposed, and as a result, there is a correction, uh -huh. and there is a painful experience that the soul experiences, and all of that happens as a result of us attempting to operate outside the law. It's impossible to operate outside of the law. We need to give up that as a concept. Yeah. And any pain that the human soul individually or collectively experiences is the result of the individual or the collective um, taking actions that are out of harmony with the, the laws that are, that are fixed and immovable. Yep. And, and nothing can change those laws yep. aside from God. And so this is the other aspect of how it's foolproof. Correct. We can't wreck the laws, we can't break the laws, we can't break our soul. We, we can't, can't manipulate the yep. law, we can't yep. uh, manoeuvre around the laws, yep. just like you can here on earth, you can manoeuvre around a bit, uh, manoeuvre around the laws, you can't do that. You can't, you can't break the soul in any physical sense or emotional sense mm -hmm. or spiritual sense, mm -hmm. actually. And, and, and any concept that you can is based on an imaginary concept that the humans have created living out of harmony with the laws of themselves. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's just a remarkable system. And the more time you spend investigating this human soul, the more remarkable it appears. Because mm. it sounds like you're saying not only is it a foolproof system, you can't buck the system, you can't override the system. So then presumably everything we're going to talk about today, which is really the system or how the soul functions, yeah. the system of the soul, if we can call it that, yeah. these things are removable from what you've just said. Yes. But, yeah. but given what you said about the laws, presumably they're all there because they're expedient and work well. Well, they're all there too because they're all loving. So uh -huh. all of God's laws are loving. So, so that means that every single law that God's ever created for the complete operation of the universe and the operation of the human soul are always loving. So all of these principles we are going to discuss are also loving. It doesn't mean that, that we're, we're going to discuss exhaustive principles because obviously we're in a process, the humanity is in a process of discovering the soul more and more and more. And, and obviously as we discover more things about the soul, there's a likelihood that we'll discover more laws that govern the operation of the soul and therefore, we can't just say these are all the all and only laws that govern the operation of the soul, yeah. but they are the laws that the laws that we're going to discuss more fully today are actually little known on the earth. You know, very few people on the earth, if any, actually 
really know these laws uh, or understand the, the principle of the operation of these laws. And, and it's only in the spirit world, in the, la in the higher spheres and dimensions, that most people have come to know the operation of these particular laws to a degree. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's to a complete degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. So <coughs> if we continue then, um, because that first, I mean, we just discussed the first sentence. There's a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you sort of went on to say that the mind is quite separate from this system of the soul. And, and perhaps if you... Um, well, yeah, uh, I wouldn't call it separate. I would call it an attribute of the soul. The soul is a very, very complex organism uh, which has, as we've discussed, multitudes of laws which, which operate upon it and govern it, its operation physically, emotionally and spiritually. And um, the mind is just an attribute or an organ of the soul. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like in your body right now, you could say you've got a liver, your kidneys, you've got pancreas, you've got gallbladder, you've got all these other organs. And then one of the organs is your brain. Yeah. Well, it's a very similar analogy with the soul. One of the organs of the soul is, you, you could think of it as the brain of the soul, which yeah. is what we classify as the mind. And this is not what most people think of as the mind, yeah. because most people don't, are not aware of the soul at all. And so what they see as the mind, if they're even partially developed, they think the mind is the brain. Yeah. And then if they're a bit more spiritually aware, they think the mind is the mind of the spirit body. Mm -hmm. And none of those things are the mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the real mind of the soul is an organ of the soul and would exist without the spirit body or the physical body existing. Yeah. And, and, it's, and that mind is a subset, if you like, of the soul itself. The soul has far more powerful organs than its own mind and is able to express itself far more powerfully through the expression of other attributes of the soul than its own mind. Mm. Mm. And I know that's something you discussed at length with Luli, so I don't yeah. want to rehash or go over that. Sure. But I suppose um, some of the questions I was thinking about are... Um, some of the implications of mind dominance on the planet and so on. But perhaps yep. sh I should ask you to read the following paragraphs and we might get to that, okay. that point. So, yep. um, for example, and this is one example of uh, the soul having many more attributes than just mm -hmm. the mind. For example, humility is a far more important attribute to develop than developing the intellect. The reason for this is that if a person is not humble on any single subject, then their mind is not capable of absorbing any new truth about the same subject. The mind that is not driven by humility that exists in the soul is always in opposition or disagreement with what is often logically obvious to a humble person. Mm -hmm. In addition, without humility in the soul, the mind will be driven to defend its own position, even when that position is obviously out of harmony with love, logic and truth. Yeah. So what I'm basically saying there is that the human soul uh, attribute of humility is far more important to develop mm -hmm. than the attribute of the intellect. Because without humility, the intellect can't actually be developed at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in other words, humility must come before developing the intellect in a certain endeavour. So unless you're, for, so for example, let's say you wanted to pick up a musical instrument. Unless you're humble to the fact that you don't know how to play it at the start and that you need to go to somebody who will teach you or read a book who will teach you or at least learn using some method, usually it comes from some other source other than, and, than yourself and you're humble enough to actually go through that process, then it's highly unlikely you'll be able to learn very much with regard to that musical instrument. Now, of course, um, many people who are prodigies are actually humble with spirit interaction and so a spirit teaches them everything they need to know but it's the same process, mm -hmm. it's still the same process. Somebody had to be humble enough to absorb that information and therefore act upon it before they could actually learn the information itself yeah. and take the actions needed to learn how to play a musical instrument. And the same applies to every single form of endeavour that you could ever think of. Mm. Yeah. And what I find fascinating about that is the fact that we do live in a world today which lords the mind and the development of the mind and those who are very intellectually clever yeah. and yet um, we don't when we neglect other really attributes. important attributes of our soul yep. we actually stunt the growth 
of, of our mind. Our, of our mind. <laughs> and so we can also set ourselves up for a lot of disappointment by trying to use our mind hmm. uh, and to grow and learn when we haven't developed other qualities yes. that would make that process a lot easier and actually ensure our success. Correct. Yeah. 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 So it's a very important factor about understanding that the soul has these other attributes, not just the intellect or, or the mind part of the soul, but the soul has other attributes which are far more logical to develop first, actually, yeah. than the mind itself is to develop. Yes. Yeah. And what I feel is happening a lot on Earth today is that most people focus on the development of their intellect and do not focus on the development of these far more important aspects of the soul. And as a result, the intellect is severely disabled. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Yep. Mm -hmm. And this is why how we come up with disabled thinking, like yeah. the whole thinking that if we if you attack me, then that gives me the right to attack you is disabled thinking. Yeah. If if we were connected with our soul, and we connected to love and humility, we w we would go, wow, that's a pretty illogical thing. Because if I attack you, you know, I hit you in the face or something, and you decide you're going to get out a knife and attack me, and sooner or later one of us is going to escalate this attack right the way through to our death, and it was pretty pointless process after that. Yeah. And and this obviously is very illogical. Yeah. Obviously very illogical, and yet we, and there are many people on earth today who would who would swear with all of their might, including die, yeah. for their right to you know attack another person for what they've done to them. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that obviously is out of harmony with true logic, mm -hmm. but, but many people think it's logical. Yeah. And that's because the, uh, there are other aspects of their soul other than their intellect that are, that, that are, that are severely lacking in development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So do you want me to read yeah, the if you next continue. one? Yep. Another example is love. Love is a far more important attribute to develop than developing the intellect. The mind is also not capable of experiencing the feelings of love. The mind is totally incapable of understanding some of the workings of the universe without the soul understanding love, both natural love coming from within the human and divine love coming from God's soul. It matters not how much is discussed with such a mind. The soul attached to the mind will not have the capacity to understand the truth about how the universe actually works without the soul receiving divine love from God. The mind will not have the capacity to understand natural love without the soul having developed its own natural love to some degree. Mm. Yeah, so this is another example of how you know, there are attributes in, in the soul that are far more important to develop than the intellect itself. And in fact, what happens and what, what we've found happens through our own experience is that the more humble you are and the more loving you become, the more you understand. Mm. So interestingly, if you develop some aspects of the soul other than the intellect, the intellect automatically is developed as a byproduct yep. of the development in these other areas. And this is because the soul itself is dominant over the intellect, over the mind. Yep. Yeah. And, and some, some qualities of the soul or some aspects of the soul, such as humility and love, when we develop those, it actually improves the function of many of the other aspects of the soul. Correct. Whereas we Including can, the mind. Including the mind, yeah. yeah. Whereas if we focus on the mind, we can focus, focus, focus and try. But as you've just said, if, unless we're working on these other things, it's limited. Yes. Whereas if we focus on humility and love, as we grow them, it doesn't... We're not limiting any other part. In fact, we're enabling... Correct. The other functions of the soul. And not only are we enabling them, we're enabling them to grow more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we have a stronger ability intellectually to absorb new information even yeah. once we develop other aspects of the soul. What, what I notice quite strongly in, in particular is that if a person is not humble or does not have love, it is very, very difficult for them to intellectually understand some concepts yeah. and it's very, very difficult for them to display logic in most of their life. Yeah. And this is because the, of the effect of the soul's development in other areas other than the intellect and how it has an impact upon the intellect. Mm -hmm. The intellect, if you like, is the, the, um, what you would classify as the effect of the causal change that occurs within the soul in other areas. Yeah. So a, a person's intellect improves in its function once 
other areas of the soul improve in their function. Yeah. Mm. And it's fascinating to consider people who've made great uh, intellectual um, discoveries. discoveries. Yep. Mm, well, all of them that I can think of at the moment started out as very humble and also developed themselves in other areas, such as music. They weren't limited simply to... They were very um, focused on desire, which is an aspect of the soul. And the fact that they didn't know and they needed to discover something, which is humble in itself. And they were always learning. That, so that was they were humble to learning. They yep. wanted to experiment a lot, which yep. is an indication of a humble soul. A, yep. a person who doesn't experiment is not generally a very humble person. Yes, yep. yes. Um, and so many of them, many of the people who we know have really made huge intellectual discoveries in our yeah. history had those attributes. Correct. Sometimes we see, though, that after making that discovery, they lose some humility. And therefore lose the attributes of further discovery. Yes. Which is an interesting thing. There, there, there are other impediments that start developing within the soul to learning yep. and one of the major impediments is a lack of humility yep. and as that develops there is an impediment to absorbing new information, yep. an impediment to becoming more loving yep. and as a result their understanding of other information that they have not yet discovered is limited. Yeah. So usually you find people who have that people have discoveries and then they get to a point usually as a bit in their older age usually it is, where they don't actually make many new discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually because of the growing lack of humility that occurs. Now, there are some people historically who haven't been like that so much and, and who, you know, they, they were humble through the entire process. And as a result, uh, they made discoveries most of their life. Mm. Um, and that, that is the subsequent result of this same law in operation. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yep. Okay. You happy to continue? Sure. If you perhaps read the next two paragraphs. Sure. Yep. As such, the mind by itself is incapable of determining, absorbing or understanding all of the divine truths of the universe without the other attributes or characteristics of the soul being engaged along with and controlling the mind's processes. If any person elects to just listen to the truth with their mind, they will never become at one with God nor will they ever actually understand or be able to automatically practice the divine truth in their daily life, nor can they ever be automatically loving in all circumstances and conditions. The mind by itself or influenced by a soul in error with regard to love can be completely irrational and illogical, while at the same time believing itself to be completely sane, rational and logical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? It is, it is. And um, we've kind of touched on, on that already. But yeah. I, I brought an example with me and it comes from an email that um, I received recently. Sure. And this is from someone who believes themselves to be very rational and logical. Yes. And I just thought perhaps I'd read a few of their statements. Sure. Um, and it, we can just um, show how illogical someone who thinks they're quite logical can be. Yes. Um, yep. And I would certainly put And this is a person who's listened to Divine Truth for six years or so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, this person's saying, I need to work through the feeling that if 90% of a teacher's class, and this is with reference to yourself, yes. um, isn't progressing after years of trying, mm -hmm. then at least some of this must reflect on the quality of the teaching. Already there's an illogical statement mm -hmm. because it's also possible from a logical perspective, that they think they're trying when they're not actually trying. Yes. <laughs> that's also possible. Yes, yes. But, but that's not stated, of course. No. No. Uh, and... Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> if we just continue the... Yeah. Uh, I intellectually understand mm -hmm. that although we may have spent decades searching for spiritual truth and on dedicated spiritual paths, that we may still not be prepared to do what needs to be done. Well, see, again, I feel there's this focus on what needs to be done rather than a focus on needing to become more loving. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a part of the problem, is that the mind says, give me the rules and I'll go and do them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. But the soul often is incapable of doing them unless you release certain emotions that prevent you from taking certain actions. Mm -hmm. 
This is an example of how the soul is governing the mind and yet the mind believes itself to be taking an action that the soul has not engaged. Yeah. Yeah, and even this, but even this idea that 90% of a teacher's class, yep. if they're not progressing, then that must reflect on the quality of the teaching. That to me seems to overlook a huge ingredient and that is the will of those in the class. Correct. It's actually stating that the teacher is in charge of the will of the student. Which is incorrect, obviously. Yeah, yeah. that's illogical to me. Yes, if we took this logic to, its, to the logic that he is using here yeah. to its full conclusion, God is the worst teacher of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> because, because hardly anybody in the whole universe is actually absorbed most of the information God's willing to provide. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, under using this analogy, we're basically saying that, uh, that God is the worst teacher in the universe because hardly anybody knows anything about what God knows. In spite of God creating an entire universe, which is designed to teach us. Correct. About ourselves and about him. Correct. Yeah. And again, it also minimises the use of our will. Yeah. It also minimises this quality of humility. Yeah. Obviously, we're unable to learn, even if we think we're able to learn, we're unable to learn unless we have true humility. Yeah. The majority of people that, I've, that I feel who are associated with divine truth have yet to develop true humility. Mm. And so they think they know things they don't know yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I feel this... This fellow is in exactly the same boat. He thinks he knows things that he doesn't know yet, and then he blames me for not understanding them correctly or not being able to feel the benefits of them. Yeah. And of course, you can't feel the benefits of something the soul hasn't grown with. Yeah. So, sure, he says he understands intellectually, and I feel those two words should never be placed together. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the reason why I feel that is because. Um, when we say to ourselves, I understand intellectually something, but mm -hmm. really we don't even understand it intellectually because yeah. the intellectual understanding of something is only possible once the soul is free to actually understand it and therefore pass on its understanding to the intellect. Yep. And this is a part of the problem that people face is they keep telling themselves they understand something when it's only, they've only heard it. Yes. They don't understand it. No. They haven't applied it in their day-to-day -day life. They've only heard it. Yeah. And hearing something doesn't cause change. No. But it's a part of something that can trigger change. Yeah. But it doesn't cause change. Change yeah. is caused by, as we will discuss later, yeah. the soul being engaged yes. through a process. Yes. And I suppose what struck me between the eyes was a person was saying to me, and they say later in their their message to me that they are quite logical or they refer to their logic yep. um, and ration, rationalising. Yeah, but, uh, logic, but every statement we've read so far is illogical. <laughs> That's yes, the irony. <laughs> yes, and to me, I, I suppose it struck me that someone who has attended six years of lectures which speak about the very things that you spoke of about the necessity for the soul to be engaged and the necessity for the will to be engaged and the fact that you will never attempt to coerce the will of a student, Correct. if you want to call it student. Or force the will of a student. Or, or force, coerce or manipulate or, manipulate or anything. Or <laughs> egg on because yeah, the yeah. whole point is for each student to engage their will Correct. with God and not with you. Correct. So then I can't see how they can see that it's a logical statement to say then if 90% of them aren't doing that, that that's your fault. Correct. When in fact... Because I'm doing it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and if, every, if somebody follows the teachings that I'm given, then they'd probably finish up doing it if yeah. they really follow it in their soul. Yes. But yeah. see, this is the trouble is most people will think they're following it, but they're only, they've only heard it. Yeah. They haven't followed it yet. Yeah. And they only try to take actions without there being any soul-based change. Yeah. And what we're trying to do in this particular session is explain to people why they are stagnant. Yes. The reason why they're stagnant, and in fact the reason why this man is stagnant, is for this exact reason. He yeah. does not understand how the soul works. And as a result, he has yet to engage the soul's operations. Yeah. And as a result, he can't practice divine truth, even though he thinks he wants to. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, I suppose, also obviously engaging with that soul process is about developing humility and growing ourselves in love. And when that doesn't happen, then we can think we're being logical when, in fact, there is no logic in no. our statements. No, and the reality is if we took this man's statements as logical, then it logically follows 
that God is the worst teacher of the universe, and I definitely cannot agree with that. No. Because that God is the person who hardly anybody listens to, <laughs> <laughs> and hardly anybody follows what God suggests. Yeah. Yep. And I would, no, I would certainly not then say that God is the worst teacher of the universe as a result. Well, even because we know God has created not just a class or a classroom or a lecture, an but entire, entire universe, universe that is universes. to teach. <laughs> universes. And that any person within it, regardless of their age, their race, even their, even their, intellect, even their intellect, can begin to learn about God without anyone else being around them. Correct. Now, to me, that's a pretty awesome teacher. Yeah. But if we begin to measure the value of teachers based on the will of their students, to me, that's not logical. Yeah. I just can't understand how that's logical. Yeah. And let's look at the way teaching occurs on the planet. Generally, the way teaching occurs on the planet is that it only occurs when there is a goal at the end. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where I feel a lot of people struggle with divine truth too. Because there is no real end goal. It's, it's, it's infinite progression that mm. is the goal. So therefore, you will always be changing. Uh, whereas what most people are used to is have a two or three year class and then they get a certificate. Yes. And that's the whole reason why they did it in the first place. Yes. In other words, they did it for an addictive reason. They wanted an, a, a result at the end that they could conceive and they only did it for that purpose. And the reality is, if we are ta taking that approach with divine truth, we're never going to learn it. Mm -mm. Because it has to be driven by a desire for the relationship with God, yeah. rather than a desire for any end goal other than that, that, that we might achieve. And as a result, there's no addictions that are ever going to be fed through the process. Yeah, yeah and humility is the state of embracing constant learning, constant receipt of new truth from yeah. God, from those around us, learning from everything around us. It's yeah. saying living in a state of humility, which is the part, of, a significant part of the way. And most people have yet to understand what that means. Yeah, yeah, well, but it does mean we are perpetually saying, I want more knowledge. I don't have it all. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So as soon as we get into this... But it's not just more knowledge. You see, this is where we've got to be careful. Yes. We're not... See, this is where the people like this man who have focused their life on the, the, on the absorption of more intellectual knowledge yeah. really struggle with divine truth. Yeah. They believe that they have spiritual development because their mind tells them so. Mm. But the reality is the spirit, true spiritual development is about love. Yeah. This is... The whole, the, how the soul functions is all about love. Mm. It's not about the intellect. And so you can tell yourself things with your intellect that have no bearing whatsoever on the true condition of your soul. Yeah. And, and, and it's only its development in love that is going to cause any change. And unless you're willing to develop your soul in love, either natural love or God's love, your soul will not change. Mm. And it doesn't matter how good the teacher is. <laughs> You will not do it yeah. because, because of your own resistance and other issues that we need to discuss about how the soul functions. Yeah, I suppose I feel now that any knowledge is not real unless it is in the soul. It's, Correct. It's just, that's it's what just I mean a, it's by just a thought. knowledge. It's, not, it's, it's just something we've heard. Yeah. It means nothing, no. actually. And it has no impact or bearing generally on our lives either, if we've just heard it. Yeah. I have about six years of university education and... Um, I often used to joke about the things that I've learnt and forgotten are amazing. You know, yeah. I've learnt and forgotten a lot of things, which shows that I didn't receive it in the soul. In the soul. I was just memorising and regurgitating. And Correct. Yeah. Because once you really learn something, it's in your soul permanently. It ne you yeah. never lose it. Yeah. You, know, you know, it never goes away. And if it's truth, divine truth, it never goes away. Yeah. If it's error mixed with truth, then obviously it's refined. Yeah. But, uh, but, it, but, yeah, if you truly learn something in your soul, it never really goes away. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. So you can't lose your memory of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, professionally, you also know that the things that you have experience with, yeah. it's, and this is why I think a lot of people criticise university education, because you do a lot of theory before practice a yeah. lot of times. And, but you know that once you've had a practical application of some of the things... It's much it, easier to remember. You, you retain it. Correct. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it's now in your experience, yes. in your soul's experience. Yes. Yeah. And this is why... It, it's, I, I find it quite ironic, really, is because that a lot of the things that people know about learning and teaching 
are actually where they have engaged their soul in some direction without actually understanding how the soul works. Yeah. If you really understood how the soul works, you could teach the soul far faster yes. and more effectively than yeah. what we currently are able to teach the soul yeah. of the humans. Of yeah. humans. Yeah. So, so it's very important for us to understand these principles because it's going to affect, like it's going to affect every area of our life, but it's going to affect how even education is embraced. Mm. Mm. If people understood these principles, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I get a bit. Uh, I think it's it's kind of crazy when people criticise you as a teacher because I watch you. You're humble. You um, embrace. You live the example of what you teach, mm. but you also constantly attempt to find a point of engagement with people mm -hmm. without altering their will. It's just a point, and mm -hmm. many good teachers do that, but God does that, mm -hmm. is constantly trying to find a point of engagement yeah. with the person. And that doesn't mean the teacher made a mistake with the previous point of engagement. <laughs> no. What it means is the teacher who loves you and he cares about you and he wants to try to work out a way that he can get yes. some information into your soul yes. <laughs> with, yes. and try to work around a lot of your resistances and denials. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Anyway, yeah. let's continue. Sure. Um, I keep reading the next two. Yeah. The mind is controlled by the soul. The mind can never fully control the soul, since the soul is not an attribute of the mind, nor is it subordinate to the mind, but rather the mind is subordinate to the soul, because it is one of the many attributes of the soul. The soul will always eventually determine the beliefs, actions, thoughts and words of the individual. I suppose that's a natural, there's nothing, I think that's a pretty clear yeah, statement. Yeah. When it comes to the absorption of truth by the soul and the mind, there are a number of basic understandings regarding how the soul operates that one needs to understand before we can really discuss what it means to live in truth. Mm -hmm. My reference to truth in the discussion below all refer to God's truth, divine truth, or as it can be also called, the absolute truth of the universe. All right, so that's the that's your preamble that you wrote before we go on to discuss the different ways that the human soul functions, yeah. the different principles. Yes. Um, I suppose I, some of the questions I had just rising from that, and you've covered a lot. We've covered a lot of what we we're going to talk about, but but let's answer the rest of those questions. And yep, I think there's two more, isn't it, that, that you had down there? The world's general idea that the mind is the ultimate tool. <laughs> yes, for experiencing the world. Yeah. And this is a problem, obviously, because it's not based in reality. We are a soul with a mind, not a, not a mind with a soul. Yeah, well, like. let's even be more specific, shall yeah. we? The human body, the physical body, has a brain. The brain controls the physiological processes within the body itself. Mm -hmm. The brain is not you and it is not your mind. Then the spirit body, which is another body that is a part that's created at the time of your conception, it also has a DNA structure, it also has organs, and it has a mind, a brain, in fact. But it's not the mind of the soul. It is a brain that controls the physiological functions of the spirit body. It controls how the spirit body works and operates. And if a person in their physical body uh, loses a part of their brain, they other parts of the brain can learn those functions. Mm -hmm. And that is a well-known fact. This is proof that the memories contained within that experience can't be contained within the mind because otherwise they would have died completely when that part of the brain died. Mm -hmm. So this is an indication that the information is coming from somewhere else, somewhere else other than the physical body's brain. Also, a spirit has the same experience. A spirit can lose a part of their brain through certain emotional conditions and therefore act as if they don't have a memory of something. But once they recover their operation of through, through some emotions, they deal with some emotions, that part of the brain fires up again and as a result, the memories get passed from the soul to that part of the brain. It's the soul that contains the mind. Mm -hmm. So we need to be very specific about this. The physical body's brain is not the mind. The spirit body's brain is not the mind. The mind, the true mind, belongs to the soul. It's an organ of the soul. Whether it's developed or not, it's an organ of the soul. For most people, it's a very poorly developed organ of the soul. Mm. But uh, it's still an organ of the soul. As such, it can potentially exist without the two bodies. 
So it can it definitely exist without the physical body because we have proof of that all the time in the spirit world. And it can also potentially exist without the spirit body. Mm. The mind can still exist because it's an organ of the soul. Now, that, that being the case, this means then that every time we focus on our intellectual development rather than our soul development, we are attempting to focus on the development of an organ rather than the entire being. Mm. And this is fraught with dangers. And, and often these dangers are very palpable. We see them in society where people have been focused in their intellectual development. For example, a scientist focused in his intellectual development de develops the atomic bomb and then they drop it. Right? That is not a very loving act. There's obviously aspects of the soul that have yet to be developed. Mm. Right? Yep. That would enable not the discovery of the atomic bomb, bomb but the use of it hmm. so the fact that we can discover certain things is fine it's how we use them that is governed by other organs in the soul hmm. and obviously a lot of people use the knowledge they've found or discovered in a very poor way completely out of harmony with love and completely out of harmony with humility or a lot of, a lot of other aspects of the soul which are far more important to develop hmm. So this is where we've got to be very careful and this is why the world has so many problems because we're so intellectually dominant we have forgotten the development of other aspects of the soul and in particular two aspects the development of love and the development of our our will in harmony with love mm. we've forgotten these two forms of development and uh, and these two forms of development are far more important to us and our future and also the survival of, the, of humanity than the development of the intellect. Mm. The intellect, of course, will develop as a result of developing these other two things. So I'm not saying that the intellect won't be developed. I'm saying we'll have a highly developed society which also is developed in these other aspects of the soul. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had a third question, didn't we, yeah. about people believing they're logical. And I think we've sort of answered that, haven't we? But I wanted to talk about the flow of information in, the, in that with regard to logic. You see, oftentimes we sort of think we're logical, but we don't know the emotions that are governing this kind of logic that we're exhibiting. So, so for example, if you put a person in a war, they will eventually believe, given enough uh, problems and trauma, they will often eventually believe that it's okay to kill other people under certain circumstances. Whether it's okay to defend yourself by killing another person or it's okay to defend your wife or your children by killing another person, they'll eventually generally believe that given today's society. Now, they believe that because of a feeling in their soul mm -hmm. that is not logical at all. Mm -hmm. But the soul, because it's open to this feeling, allows that thought to pass through and therefore distort the logic of the individual. Because it makes no sense. If I kill you, then sooner or later someone with you with the, around you with the same belief is going to want to kill me. And if I kill more of you, more of your family, then they'll probably want to kill more of my family. Eventually this will escalate and escalate turn into a national war and eventually become even worse. And, and, and in this last century just passed, we had world wars governed by that particular concept. <laughs> yep. And as uh, Gandhi said, you know, eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. There's the demonstration of true logic. Yeah. What, what he said was a demonstration of true logic. Now, why did he have that logic when the average person on the earth has a completely different logic? He had that logic because he had more love in his soul. Mm -hmm. And this love in his soul governed, he could see very clearly that the logic that other people were using wasn't logical at all. It was completely illogical. Yeah. It made no sense whatsoever for the long-term survival of the human race. And so he could see that very clearly because he had more love in his soul. And this is an example of how when you've got more love in your soul or your soul is further developed, you get to see things logically completely different mm -hmm. to how or completely differently to how other people see them yeah yeah and this the reason for this is that when there is an emotion in the soul 
only certain types of information are allowed to pass in the mind of the individual connected to uh, who, who of the of that soul yep. of that individual so if i have a, f a feeling in my soul that preservation of myself at all cost is justified yeah then it my mind will logically assume from that particular feeling that i can defend myself to the point of killing somebody else yeah so basically you're saying that our logic is based upon what we believe is true. Correct. And when there are false beliefs or errors within what we believe to be truth, and we base our reasoning upon those, those errors. things, our logic will actually become very illogical. Very illogical. In, and all, in fact, even irrational and sometimes even psychotic. Yeah. <laughs> That's how bad it can become. Yeah. And yet we think that it's logical. Yeah. Right. So this is a big problem uh, that people need to understand, I feel. The flow of information inside from the soul to the mind and inside the mind through the intellect into our expression is completely governed by the feelings and belief systems that are, that are inside of the soul at any mm -hmm. one point in time. It's not governed by logic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I would classify as true logic, because true logic is always in harmony with love, always in harmony with truth, always in harmony with humility and always in harmony with many other qualities that are like that, you know, harmony with ethics and, and those kind of qualities. Most people don't have true logic. I've met, you know, very intellectually developed people who I would consider to be almost totally illogical when it comes to certain reasonings mm -hmm. and arguments. Mm -hmm. And you can reason with them and once you reason with them on those particular subjects that they're illogical, they get angry. <laughs> They get angry, they get, they get uh, you know, critical, not only just critical, but they become violently abusive with their, with their rage. And that's all because they know they're being illogical. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and they know that the logic that's being presented to them is confronting certain emotions inside of them. Yeah, that isn't it? them to respond that way. Isn't it because that they, the emotions, the error-based emotions are being challenged yes. through the expression of logic. Correct. And because there's a fear of those things, yes. then there's a resistance placed up to that. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So, so I feel it's very important to say that any soul-based emotions and beliefs that are out of harmony with the laws of love, there is going to be a resistance to the flow of true logical information coming into our mind. Yeah. And as a result of that, we are going to think we're logical when we're totally illogical mm. and we'll make no sense at all. And we believe we're making sense. Yep. That's the trouble. Yep. We believe we're making sense when we're making no logical sense at all if we analyse all of the factors. Yeah. So, so with the example you gave before of the man who made the statement about my teaching, mm -hmm. he hadn't thought that if he took that logical argument to its full conclusion, that he's really saying that God is the worst teacher of the, uh, in the universe. Yeah. He hasn't thought through this so-called logical argument that he has. And therefore, the argument is not logical. It is driven by his emotions. And let's talk about some of the emotions that are driving it. The emotions that are driving are, are his own resistance to feelings, his own resistance to emotions. His belief that other people have a problem before he does, in other words, his own arrogance and his lack of humility, these are all the emotions in his soul that are driving that thought. Yeah. Because if he thought in a far more humble and loving way, he'd see that God, who's the best teacher in the universe, has hardly any connection to most of the people on this planet, right, in comparison to what's possible, and that is because of the resistance of the individual and the use of their will. And why could that also not apply to my teaching others? Yeah. He would, he would yeah. automatically see that. Yeah. So it seems very clear that our understanding of what is logical is based on what we believe to be truth. Yes. And if, if we are wrong in what we believe to be true, then we cannot be logical because we, our, our mind or our intellect is only functioning with what the soul is saying is truth. Yeah. And let's be and more definite about it. If we are wrong from God's perspective, because yep. that's really the perspective we're looking at here, if we're wrong from God's perspective, even though we're right from our own, we will not be logical. Yeah. We, we, in fact, it's impossible for us yeah. to be so. Yeah. And this is why humankind make many, many very 
intellectually developed people on this planet make very unwise choices and decisions. Yeah. And the main reason why is because they have not developed these other aspects of their soul that are more important to develop than their intellect. Mm. And, and it, as that uh, message that I received went on, that man began to make what he felt were more logical assumptions about your action and behaviour and your, predicting your future actions even based on things that were not true from God's perspective. And Correct. so and we're so not even indicative of what you were doing, what you were thinking or what you or were going to do. what I will do. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. He's making a lot of presumptions and assumptions based on his own illogical argument. And that's not my logical argument. Yeah. My logical argument is more encompassing love and truth and therefore uh, I will not take the actions that he thinks I will in the future. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm. well, that's just a bit about our introduction. Yeah, yeah, so that's probably the conclusion of our introduction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks.